Hey, those watching on HolyWild.tv, thanks for tuning in. This is our opportunity to give, so you have an opportunity there also on your phone or tablet or whatever it is you're watching. If you need to offer an envelope, lift your hand. We thank you for your faithfulness. Again, so excited about what happened on Sunday. I, I am usually, if I remember correctly, almost always gone this week somewhere because it's always after the muscle car Sunday I because I know that the church is going to be a little diminished. Well, he's happy tonight. So, but I'm glad to be here with you. I think we got something to say, something to share with you. Also, uh, those watching, tell others to tune in. And, uh, but Sunday morning, we fed 1,450 people. So that's just a, and that's just who we fed. We don't know who all came in. I know the tractors never quit driving as far as I know, did they, Dusty? Y'all drove from about uh, 9 o'clock till uh, 4 o'clock. Yeah, y'all still running? Four, five, how many tractors? Four or five tractors? Five or six tractors. We had more tractors this year than usual. So it was, good. it was a good day. But it just if you could open up a clock, a watch, and see the little gears in it, that's what reminded me of that day. So many little things taking place, whether they were somebody pulling the little kids and little barrels around the property and tractors coming in. I think they fed all them people in like 30 minutes. I, I, I couldn't – I turned around and everybody done gone through. It was unreal. And all of that had to do with preparation. Now, this week we prepare ourselves for Easter. And when I was a young boy, uh, Easter was just about die, dying eggs. Simply you die an egg and, and go hunt it. And that's all you do. I did not know anything about an empty tomb. I didn't know about Christ. I didn't know any, any of that stuff. So I'm excited about this year. And uh, so invite somebody. People will come this Sunday that normally won't come other times. You know, and with uh, Notre Dame Cathedral burning, is all of a sudden now everything's, I mean, at least for the Catholic Church, is in light. But I hope it is for you, too, that you looked in there because it's still a church, and you can see the cross was still there. Now, I don't have a lot of hope in that, uh, that crown of thorns. Well, you know, it, it didn't look like the crown I, I read about, but I'll leave that alone. Uh, but uh, I, I just know that there's it, those things still raise faith up in people's lives. So quick announcements, guys. You know that right after Easter, we're going to take a ride to the Hill Country on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Love to have anybody wants to ride out with us. Yes. Amen. Zion's Lions. I'm, I'm excited about riding. Uh, the flowers may all be gone, but the curves will still be there. Yes. Amen. So it's going to be a, a good time. A lot of good stuff coming up. Father, I thank you for an opportunity to give tonight. We thank you for what you've done. Lord, let your kingdom come on this earth. We want to be invited into the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Of all power, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, we were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones. Fall of me above all, above all. Amen. tonight guys thank you i'll give the band another hand thank you guys did a fantastic job on sunday the weather was chilly you know we had bad weather blow in but it's still we, we made it happen i thank you guys for being with us got your bibles luke chapter 22 matthew mark chapter 22 
I have heard for years that you can't fix stupid. I disagree. I believe you can fix stupid. But I think you're going to need help. I think Jesus can help fix stupid. Can I get an amen? A lot of you, before you were born again, even afterward, you realized you'd done some stupid things, and you knew that Christ can fix that, and we just lean on Him. So tonight, I want to talk to you that Jesus can fix stupid. Uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 31. And, and by the way, you're at verse 31. I want to back up just a little bit to verse 28. Uh, and the reason why we, we walked into this, this thought uh, on Sunday, while Saturday night, Chuck and I were out on the motorcycles, uh, Chuck Bergen, and I, while we were riding, something hit me about the ear, the right ear being cut off. And I got back, and that Sunday morning, I looked at the band and said, now you, don't, you don't know this if, unless you you'd heard the whole message. I said, I'm stopping at the ear. The ear is, is the end of the sermon. I'm going to do something that I've never done. I'm going to use that ear, that right ear. And I used the right ear, and I mean, and it just, everything shifted in the service, and I felt uh, God touching the hearts of the people, and it was just a great time to connect with folk. Jesus said to Peter, this is, this is during the time of the uh, supper, the last supper. So they've had the bread, they've had the wine. Uh, Judas has gone out, it's nighttime, and Jesus is having an intimate talk with the disciples, and he says to them here in verse 28, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. And aren't you, uh, I think it's a, a proverb that says uh, uh, that if you stand with me in my trials, you can celebrate with me in my victories. But if you were not with me in my trials, you have no right to celebrate with me in my victories. And I, I thought that was, that's a good proverb. And I, can, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, you've got to realize what an exciting thing for Jesus to tell them that you're going to get to sit with me. You're going to, get, you're going to be involved in kingdom rule. There's going to be, in other words, guys, this is one of them little insights you get about heaven, that there's going to be some ruling and reigning. There's going to be some uh, amazing things going on. And then he looks at Peter, and he says to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now, skip down to verse 49. When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they're in the garden. You remember, they've been sleeping. Now they woke up from their sleep. Judas is coming up. Soldiers are coming up with him. Malchus is coming up with him, the servant of the high priest. And they said, and, and when they saw what was going to happen, they said this, Lord, should we strike with our swords? So all of them had a sword. All of them had an opportunity to fight, Peter, James, and John. So here, here's this moment, and the Scripture says, and one of them, not waiting on a reply, not waiting on an answer, moved very quickly and, and pulled out his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this, and he touched the man's ear and healed him. Do you realize that uh, that was a stupid move? Would you agree with me? This is stupid. Now, take the ear off right there at that moment. And it was, it was unnecessary. It wasn't, it wasn't needful. And he's the only one with a sword. I, I'm sure he looked back at James and John and said, hey, aren't you with me? Amen. Aren't you going to help me out of this moment? But it sure didn't happen. And here's the thing. There are extremes of stupidity. The, the book of Proverbs details two groups. One of them is the pig-headed fool. They are, uh, their attitudes are slothful and lazy. We see that with the disciples while they're sleeping instead of helping. The other fool is a bullheaded fool. Now, you don't have to answer to any of these right now, but, you, but, you're, but somebody can help you. But they're stubborn and hot-headed. This was Peter at this moment. In other words, Peter went from one extreme to another. On fire for God, I can, I can do whatever. I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a part of the kingdom. To at this moment, sleeping. The next moment, striking. These are not temperaments. They're not temperaments. Sanguine, melancholy, choleric, phlegmatic, those are temperaments. Extrovert, introvert, parts of our temperaments. Yet, you know, when somebody is bullheaded, that's not a temperament. Pig-headed, lazy, that's not a temperament. Those are attitudes. And they're attitudes that you can pick up on. And not only that, they're attitudes that you can lose. You don't have to always be pig-headed. All of us like a little sleep sometimes. 
too much sleep, too much slumber, to fold of the hands is going to lead to poverty. What the scripture says, bullheaded always snorts with anger. When you see the bull, you think of the anger. You realize there's meanness there. So this is going to happen. You know, we're, we're serving God with all the things that we got. And I want to thank God that he can fix stupid. 600 Roman soldiers with swords. Peter, in a moment of anointed stupidity, draws his sword, cuts off Malchus' ear. Stupid is as stupid does. The odds were not in his favor. It was unnecessary. It, it didn't need to happen. Uh, Jesus could have called angels in to have taken his place, but no, it, it wasn't that way. So Peter began to drift. And this, I think the beautiful thing is, is extremes need balance. Extremes come from trying to correct something too fast. I've been an extremist in my life. I've gone from one end to the other side. And, and it takes a little while, but what happens is, watch when people, uh, a diet can be one thing, when you get to an extreme. So you just, instead of dieting and eating stuff, you're fasting all the time. Well, that's, that's not a diet. That's fa that, I mean, that's not fasting. That's dieting. That's starving yourself. That's an extreme. Another extreme, breaking addictions, things like that. We go all the other side. Many times when you get born again, if you were like me, you were all the way to the other side. I was an absolute Jesus freak. Amen. And I'm telling you, for a little while there, I think I turned everybody off to Jesus instead of turning to Jesus. It took me a little while to get back. But I find that you can tame fire, but you've got to raise the dead. Amen. So, I mean, God helped do that to me. And he touched his ear and healed him, saved his life. He said, no more of this. How many times has our bullheadedness got us in trouble? Amen. An ear laid on the ground, a word spoken. Somebody was disfigured, dislocated because we got mad and blew up under the pressure. Or we slept when somebody else was in need. And we see this. In whole, we see that Peter began to drift so in verse 54 and verse 62. When then seizing him, when they grabbed hold of Jesus, they led him away, and they took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But he denied it. And again, by the way, cutting off the ear was a great way for everybody to know who you were. <laughs> you can't be incognito now. Everybody knows that it was you. you got blood on your sword. Woman, he said, I don't know him. He said, a, a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I'm not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with, with him, and he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Buck, 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 buck. That's a chicken, isn't it? Well, that's the best I can do. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you're going to disown me three times. And he went outside, and he wept bitterly. Now, let me take you back up here to verse 28 again, where he said, you are those who stood by me in my trials. You stood with me, and I conferred to you my kingdom, just as my father conferred to you on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table, and you're going to be a judge. And then Simon, Simon, Satan's desire to sift you, but I prayed for you that your faith won't, hate, won't fail. Here's our thing. Many times we get a word in church, something like that, and all of a sudden we go through a little time of failure, a little fear, a little something hits us, and we get, uh, we get shaken. After hearing these kind of words, no wonder Peter jumped up. Up, yanked out his sword, cut off an ear. My goodness, I'm going to rule and reign with him. I stood by him in the trials. And now here he is in his trial. And Peter has denied him three times. And the rooster has crowed. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. So somewhere in the house where Peter was in the courtyard was a straight beeline eye of sight. And when Jesus looked at him, and we all know the stare of somebody we've let down. We all know that feeling when, 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 when as a, a child your parent looks at you, they told you not to do it, and you got chocolate all over you. And they look at you with them eyes, knowing you ain't getting in my new car today. Hey, man, you're not, you're not crawling up in my truck today. Or you're going to have to take care of that first. Those, 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 and those were those burning eyes when he looked at him, and Peter realized that he had done wrong. He went outside, and he began to cry. And all of us, I think, have been in this place before. We feel like we failed him. If you're not, you're not being honest with yourself. That we've done the wrong thing. We've, we've done Peter. The Bible says he followed at a distance. In other words, he drifted. He slipped. And I don't know how quick the word got out. But by morning, you know what happens. Judas has hung himself. So all of this is taking place at almost simultaneously at the same time. One man deserted. One man betrayed. 
and here this is all going on in Christ's life, following at a distance. And I, I'm amazed, and again, being there Sunday morning and looking at 1,500 folk, I realized that some of them were following at a distance. And I hear it a lot. But probably the best thing I heard after church was all those people that came up to me and said, we didn't know y'all were here. This is the kind of church we'd like to go to. We believe in God, and we, want, we, we think we found our church. Well, I'll give it another chance. And we got one over in Crosby, too. This is what we're after. Amen. We're trying to go more low, not just local, but keep spreading out. Keep believing God for more and more uh, reaching people for the kingdom. Peter sat with them. Now, listen, if you want to show yourself stupid, set with stupid people. If you tell me who you hang out with, I'll tell you who you are. And that's what Peter did. He began to sit and hang out. I'm not talking about you, Marie, here. A little later, look at it, a little later, someone else saw him and said, you, you also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. Buk, 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 buk. You know, the word backslide needs to deny by word or deed. To have opportunity to stand up, to have an opportunity to do the right thing, to have an opportunity to say the right thing, and you don't do it. That's a simple backslide. It doesn't mean you just went off and fell into, uh, back into your old ways all the time. It means you're not as far today as you were. Where was he just hours before then? Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Jesus sitting at his feet. Him hearing those words, Simon, Satan's desired you, that he may sift you. I prayed for you. I'm praying for you. Amen. I'm the Lord of lords, the king of kings. I'm praying for you. And now at this moment, he's beginning to deny. He's beginning to slip back some. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow is, was with him. He is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking again, the rooster crowed, and the rooster crowed. Aren't we glad we know Peter's life, though, though the rooster crowed and things went bad? He got things right again. He turned things back around. As a matter of fact, we realize that that prayer for Christ, that from Christ, wasn't just for that moment. David shared a good word here. It was a purging moment. It was an opportunity to help purge him as he go, he's starting to go through the trials, too. And don't, don't miss the grace. Everybody say grace. grace. What is it that keeps us from being, to keep falling back into stupid? It's the grace of God. It's the grace. Look at this verse, Hebrews 12, 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You don't have to be in this life long to realize how life this verse is, how powerful this is. Looking, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. It, it, it's a true story that bitterness affects everybody around you. And all you got to do is hang out with bitter, and you're going to get bitter. And it, it's bitterness that rises up. It begins to tank. The New International Version says, See to it that no one misses the grace of God, and that no bitter root causes, uh, grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So looking diligently just simply means beware. Pay attention to it. Look at it. Look. You don't have to respond to every criticism that comes your way. You don't have to respond to every negative that comes your way. I've, I've learned, I, I scroll very fast in social media because I don't want to read everybody's stuff because something may jump on me, and I'll find myself wanting to comment on stupidity, realizing that you have no, how many times I have punched things in and erased it and went on and thought to myself, I let God deal with that. Amen. That ain't on me. I don't care if it's a me, me, or anything else that somebody's trying to throw up there. I'm just keep right on going, man. I ain't going to pay no attention to that. Listen, looking diligently. Of, of, what am I beware of? Beware of what, Pastor? Beware. Beware what happened to Judas that night. Bitterness is what caused Judas to get where he was. Bitterness had entered into him. And Jesus, watch what he did. He separated him from the group. Many times we'll do this number. I remember being a youth pastor, and we'd always go after the bad apples to get them running to the youth services or, or get them to youth camp. Always about youth camp. Oh, we're going to invite all the bad. And this is what I found out. Every time I invited the bad seeds to youth camp with me, they caused problems. They were breaking out at night. They were raiding the girls. The girls raiding the boys. They, they were disrespectful in the service. They were smarting off. Every now and then, God would show up and spank them. I mean, I had one service where that actually happened. And it, a matter of fact, I think two right now, where I took one boy to Mexico with me. And I'm telling you, his mama asked me to take him. And I loved this boy because he, he was adopted. And that was it. He never talked about it. But, but God showed me that. I didn't even know he was adopted. Let me just tell you the story real quick. Go down to Mexico. We're on our way. We're pulling two vans and two. Uh, this was way back when I was a, a, a youth pastor, and we're carrying two car cargo behind us. We get into Mexico. We're heading up in the mountains, 
heading to Torreon. And when we're coming down, we realized the nut on the on under the uh, the the good the, the ball, the nut had has uh, had like one turn left from coming off. And had it come off, then the ball in the trailer would have popped off. The next thing, who knows what would happen? So we tighten that up. No big deal. Then we go on down to Mexico, and one of my one of my boys got boots on, and he jumps into a, a, a creek. We're standing having a picnic by a creek with a bunch of other youth. Jumps in the creek in Mexico. Well, somebody had jump in and rescue him. His boots filled up. He almost drowned, went underwater. Somebody yanked him out of the water. Then another kid gets on the back of a burrow, and the burrow bucks. He flips him over and almost snaps his neck. And I'm looking at this going, this is not what I signed up for. <laughs> I mean, it's going on and on. Then, then I get a night when somebody says to me that this young boy, Luke, he's 16-year-old, he played football at Channel View, he had snuck out with some, and got some other boys to go with him. They went and got beer and got drunk. Now, this is another, another reason I, I'm not... We're down here to do mission work. So about two days later into this, by the end of the week, I realized this thing ain't going right. So I sat in a church service. Uh, we had a little service before we left. And I remember sitting there, and I'm saying, and I, I shared on Aiken how Aiken had taken the silver. And he had, he had taken the, and I didn't even know at the time that that was even the tithe. I didn't even preach on the tithe about that. About that. I was in the youth ministry, you know. But if they took something that was holy under God, he took something, and he should have never done it. And I looked at this young boy, and I said, Luke, I said, you know what your problem is? You're adopted, and you think your mom and daddy don't love you. He broke like a baby. I mean, this, he, played, he was a linebacker, started weeping and crying. And as he's crying, the other kids begin, and we started having revival. So what I'm saying, and I'm telling you, when we came out of Mexico, we hummed out of Mexico. No problems, everything. was. It was like God just lifted the veil and let everything, because what we determined to be sin in the camp. We found what was wrong and dealt with it. Now, there are other times, though, I've gone to camp, and I said, Lord, I'm, I'm not bringing this in or that. It ain't worth begging them to come and begging them to stay. And then what happens, you separate that, and then all of a sudden now everybody else is good here. Uh, am I making some sense here? you got to discern the when and when not to. Let me just say it like that. So I, I'm careful with that because I'm after everybody I can reach. But Jesus, this moment, he was not going to leave Judas in that room to tank the rest of the disciples and deal with them and aggravate them and frustrate them while he's trying to teach them. And tell them. I mean, what if he said, Simon, Simon, I've prayed for you. And Judas goes, hey, what about me? You going to pray for me? Do I get to set in the kingdom? Do I get to do that? Knowing that his hand was in the bag and he was going to betray him that night. So he separates him and removes him out of the way. And when he does, then he begins to deal with something. Here's the problem. You've got to beware of the slip of bitterness. By the way, Peter was different from Judas. Judas hung himself. Peter... The stupid got fixed when he found an empty tomb. When he went to the tomb, everything was fixed inside of him. Man, when he got there, it was like, yeah, I know what's going on. Beware the slip of bitterness, the secretive nature of bitterness. Oh, pastor, I would never get bitter. Don't say that. You don't know what life's going to throw at you. You don't know how hurt can hit and when it can hit. And it may not hit you, but it may hit somebody else you love, and you just joined right in with it. Be careful of the slip of it. It's secretive when it comes in. Slipping slowly over time, undetected. You didn't realize it. Beware of the grip of bitterness, the paralyzing effect of bitterness. Thereby many are defiled, they're contaminated. When I say grip, I'm talking about grip. You think about it. You're in jail to it. Your mind's always on it. I'm sure it's unforgiveness. It's anger that wasn't dealt with properly. Hurt that turned to anger. Anger to bitterness. Bitterness to hatred. Hatred to murder. Always runs that place. Beware of the clip of bitterness, the exorbitant cost of it. Just stay bitter. It's going to affect your health. It's going to give you cirrhosis of the, of, of the giver and the liver. Amen. You'll quit giving and, and quit living. It, it'll start shutting you down. What happens, and I'll just tell you, first you have loss of humor. You can't laugh anymore. Things ain't funny anymore. Things that used to make you laugh. They Sunday, Sunday morning, we, we kind of threw something out real quick. We did a little slapstick, some of you noticed. And it was different. You know, I had the, I had the Romans falling down, and, and then we had Peter's cutting off Malchus's ear and running all over the property trying to catch him. And we actually shortened the song because when we practiced it, the song was so long, the guys gave out. So... We had, to, we had, to, and, I, and Chuck was down there. Some of y'all know Chuck Berger. He was down there laughing about it during practice. He didn't realize I was going to pull him up on stage and make him John. He was going to be John. So when everybody took off running, he started laughing. I said, why are you laughing? Get running, boy. And if you, if you watch the little video, you'll see me sending him off the stage, and he's got that pot belly running. I laughed. I laughed. You got to keep your humor. Without humor, you crack. Amen. You dry up and you crack. Second, a loss of relationships. 
You start losing really good relationships whenever you start getting bitter. Uh, you have loss of joy. The joy leaves your life. Loss of prosperity. All of a sudden, you're not interested in being prosperous in life. Loss of witness and opportunity to influence others to Jesus. Listen, when you're bitter and you tell people you're a Christian, they don't believe you. Because they believe in a risen Lord that changes lives when people get born again. Amen. So you, they're not going to believe your witness. So you've you got to get rid of it. Uh, there's, this, there's a place of no return. And we don't talk about it a lot. But I believe it's there. Judas turned that way. I'm not going to put Judas in hell. I, 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 a guy asked me today. He said, Pastor, my, my so-and-so family member is dying. We don't know if he's saved. Uh, would you mind going with me next week to go see him? And I've done this hundreds of times. I said, yeah, I'll go with you. But you don't know. He said, I don't know. I said, whether you know it or don't know it, I'd like to meet him. Because I think for somebody just to know that somebody cares for them at the last stages of their life matters. So I'd like to go. I'd just like to be with them. Okay. So Luke 16, 19 tells us, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and in fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores. Let's talk about luxury. Let's talk about homes with padded couches, chairs, nice floors, air conditioned in the summertime, heated in the wintertime, water that comes out of not one, not two, not three, but four taps in the house, and with a turn of a switch can turn hot. Let's talk about luxury. You realize almost all of us in here live in luxury. Amen. We, draw, we, we brought an outhouse out Sunday morning, pulled that thing out, and everybody thought I was in it. I'm always coming in some way. I had a man named Greg Purdy inside. They thought it was me. I could not give you that image for the rest of your life to see me coming out of an outhouse. But now when I was young, we had an outhouse, and it was not luxury. We didn't have running water. We drew it up in buckets and brought it in the house. We heated on the stove. Uh, we had one heater in the kitchen. And you got up in the morning, everybody ran to that heater. It heated on both sides. It was one of them coal ones. And you straddled that thing when you got tall enough. And you worked yourself. And you had your britches on. Somebody going to come by and pull your pant leg and burn the other side of you after it heated up real good. And even to us then, compared to those that lived 30, 40 years ago, we were in luxury. So when I read this, don't see somebody in a palace somewhere. Think of your own self. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to the Abraham side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell. Everybody say in hell. Where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Abraham, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. I mentioned Sunday. One of our problems in America is our good things. And when you allow good things to take, a place, take the place of Christ in your life, we have problems. We have idolatry. So we, you can enjoy your homes, your luxury, all, and you know I have good things, and I'll have good things. But I cannot let any of them take the place of Christ in my life. It's very, very important. We catch hold of this, and we understand it. Thank God he gave us those things to enjoy. Amen. We don't, have, we don't beat ourselves up because I get to ride my scooter or, 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 or ride my hot rod or, or be in, live in a home. Uh, man, when it gets too hot in there and I can afford it, I bump that AC down. I make no apologies. I've sweated in homes before. We had one air conditioner. I remember when the first air conditioner got in our house, a 110 window unit. It was put in my mama and daddy's room. I always want to go back and visit mom and daddy in the summertime. Amen. Because I just because that's where the cool was. I, you know that that was life then. Until you, everybody got window units. We had all everybody had a window unit. Man, we had a big one. I remember when we finally got that two twenty window unit. I forgot we put it in. I was out behind the house before uh, I thought I was there before mom and daddy got there, and I was hot boxing a cigarette as fast as I could before they got there, and I heard them yell, hey, Jerry, and I took off running, and I was high as a kite. I, I don't know if you, you know what I'm talking about, but if you ain't had one in a while, and I hadn't had one, I was dizzy, and I run around, and I hit, the, hit that big box sticking out the window, laid me on the ground, looked stupid, stupid. God can fix stupid. Can I get an amen? He's been working on me. 
You guys bring stories up in my life. And besides all this, between, watch this. But Abraham replied, son, son, remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. Man, now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Remind, let me remind you, the good things he had was temporary. Temporary. The good things we have now, they're temporary. Notre Dame Cathedral, 850 years old, burnt. It's temporary. I don't care how old it is, it's going back to the dust. While Abraham, while Lazarus was there, he had temporary. Now he has eternal. Swip, flip the switch, the rich man is in eternity with, in hell. With, oh, my goodness, this is good. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses, they have the Bible, the Pentateuch, the first five books, and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes back to, in other words, the, the Bible wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to get me right. It wasn't enough to get them right. Nobody's listening. He said, but if somebody goes back to them from the dead, they'll repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they'll not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. We've all seen miracles. We've seen people chase miracles. We've seen miracles in our own life. And many times we still find ourselves falling back into this trap of being stupid. Amen. God, how many know he can fix it? Amen. Let me close with a few thoughts here. In your lifetime, he said, you received not God's, you received good things. You took what you wanted. You did your thing. You were callous to those around you. I think the big thing is, is not being callous to others, to be tender toward them. Uh, the worst mistake any of us can make is not to make a decision to serve him. It's just the bottom line. He said, while you were there, you had an opportunity. So what do we do? It ain't me just talking to you guys. It's us talking to others. Reminding them this, particularly as we're coming up on this weekend, you have an opportunity to get stupid fixed. Amen. To see life turn around for you. To see it change. You don't want to slip. You don't want the grip. You don't want the clip of bitterness in your life. You want to get past that. Stand with me. Wouldn't it be awful to spend eternity hearing my voice going, Buck, 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 buck it. Buck, 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 buck it. And thinking to yourself, I heard that preacher acting like a, a rooster, sounding like a hen about the three denials of Peter. And I walked away from it. I didn't pay any attention to it. I think tonight, for those watching online and those here, paying attention to this message is a very powerful thing. I'm glad to be here with you. I'm glad to share this with you. I'm one of those that I can tell you that got his ear put back on. I'm one of those that cut ear off and Jesus saved me by putting their ears back on for my stupid mistake and my violent outburst and my anger and my pride and all the things that I've done. He put the ears back on. So he fixed stupid for me and he gave me a chance. Simon, Simon, Satan desires to sift you, to agitate you. Y'all know what agitation is? You, you do understand agitation. Just agitate. Agitate. Just, just agitate. Just. Are we there yet? 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 You know what I'm talking about agitate. Satan has desired to agitate you. Or you could take a punch in the gut, a slap in the face. But just agitating, agitating, agitating. Just constant. He, he just wants to wear you down. Agitate you. But I prayed for you that your faith fell not. Now your friends, they're going to fail you. Your finances, mm, they're going to fail you. It's your faith. Your flesh, it's going to fail you. You're going to get up one day and hit the ground and think, where did that knee go? You know, what happened? It's going to fail you. But your faith, you hold on to it. 
Hold on to your faith. I pray for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, it doesn't mean that you aren't, aren't born again. It means that when the next change comes, and the next change comes, and the next change comes, when you're converted, strengthen your brothers. When you made it through this trial, and you say to them, I know you're being agitated. I've been agitated too. You're going to get through this. I know you've been hurt, but you're going to get through this. I know you've been dislocated, dissected. I know somebody tried to take your ear off, but I'm telling you, Jesus can fix stupid. Amen. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus tonight. Again, holding my right ear, thanking you for all the things you've done in my life. I give you praise for this house those watching i pray god you fix the stupid in our lives you give us the ability to get up and keep on going lord well, i know we cut an ear off i know it happened but you put it back on thank you help me to put up my sword to not be mean or begrudging help my faith stand strengthen the faith of this house in jesus name amen amen god bless you guys amen watch us easter morning this house will be packed so be watching us if you're not able to get here in Jesus' name. Amen.